everybody, welcome to the Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin Show. I am Jeff Rubin, and today we are having our book club episode and discussing The Martian by Andy Weir. And to do so, we are joined by Laura M. Brooker, a PhD student studying the surface of Mars. Welcome to the show, Laura. Hello. Laura, thank you so much for being on the Skype on my phone today. But before we get into it, give me just a minute because I want to lay down some ground rules for the listeners. First of all, uh, we're going to be discussing the book The Martian and not the major motion picture starring Matt Damon. I think the book uh, is really unique and special and deserves its own spotlight. And basically, this is my podcast, so kind of whatever I say goes. Also, uh, you may recall two weeks ago that I assigned everyone the homework of reading the book. Uh, and kind of like your teacher, I'm going to just assume you did the homework. So if you're thinking the whole Martian franchise is something you might want to catch up with one day, this, this, today's podcast might not be the episode for you. With all that in mind, I got one more thing I want to do before we talk about the book, which is learn a little bit more about Laura. Laura, uh, I'd love to understand a little bit more about your background. Of all of the sciences, of all of even the planetary sciences, how did you end up studying Mars? Um, well, it really started when I was young. I've always been fascinated by space. Since I was really little, my dad used to take me out and use telescopes to look up at the night sky. Um, so when it came time to choosing what I actually wanted to study, uh, I really wanted to study something surrounding that. But specifically, I'm actually a geologist in background. Um, I studied at the University of Leicester, geology with geophysics. Um, but in my master's year, I actually did a project on Mars. I studied some data from the Curiosity rover. Um, um, and then since then, it's kind of developed. I've done a PhD. I've just uh, finished my first year of PhD studying the surface of Mars. And that's how I've uh, managed to get into it, just constantly driving for my passion for this subject. So you you took uh, studying geology and just applied that to another planet. How do we know anything about the rocks from Mars? Like, how, how do you actually learn something about the surface from Mars? Where's your data come from? Well, it can actually be quite challenging because, as you know, Mars is uh, very far away from us. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> but we are quite lucky because every now and then we're lucky enough that an impact will strike the surface of Mars and it'll actually send meteorites to Earth. Um, so that's one of the ways in which we study the rocks of Mars through these Martian meteorites that manage to get to the Earth's surface. And the other way, which is what I do, is we use satellites that are currently in orbit around Mars, uh, which are mentioned quite frequently in the Martian, um, to actually take photos photographs, very high detailed, high resolution photographs of the surface. And then we could try and infer some ideas as to uh, the processes that have shaped this planet's history. What's something you can, you know, that humanity has figured out about Mars, about the surface of Mars even, just from looking at pictures of it? Um, yeah, well, one of the uh, big discoveries is the fact that liquid water has flowed and, as we know from this week, is likely still flowing on the surface of Mars. And these are through images that have been taken using a high rise in particular because it's a very high resolution um, images that we get, 25 centimetres per pixel, just to give you an idea. Um, and you can actually see things like fluvial channels, so these are river channels on the surface of Mars, um, things that could only really have been carved through the actions of liquid water. Um, so that's one of the big discoveries discoveries that we've made and actually the discovery this week was um, using a spectral signature so they actually studied these things called recurrent slope linear and um, they found that when they analyzed them um, they were able to see that there's a signature for hydrated per uh, perchlorates they're called hydrated perchlorates which is a uh, hydrated salt so salts with water in them basically um, so Possibly this indicates that these uh, features that we see, these RSL, have actually got salty water. They're formed by salty water on the surface of Mars, which is a really big discovery. And it's a, a big thing for particularly if you're thinking about life on Mars. And this is something we didn't know two weeks ago. This is the kind of the news that came out about Mars uh, just this very week. Um, just this very week, it was announced um, that officially they've uh, they've got this spectral signature, um, but it has been debated for quite a while as to uh, what actually formed these streaks, and uh, salty water was one of the uh, big suggestions um, that we've had, because we've been observing these RSL for quite a long time now, um, but it's this confirmation that's come out this week that they've got this signature of hydrated salt, so it's really big news for the Martian community, um, so we're all very excited about it. All right, well, let's start turning this into the book a little bit. Let's say that uh, we had confirmed this news uh, months ago, or even years ago, I guess, when, when this book was first written. Uh, how, would this have affected Mark Watney's life on Mars at all? Um, I think it might have 
just slightly because actually um, he often has to use a water reclaimer to try and get water on the surface of Mars. And at one point he actually has to burn, um, try and get water from rocket fuel, which is very dangerous. Um, but actually there's probably large ice deposits and now we know that there could be you know, water actually flowing on the surface of Mars. So he could have had a bit of an easier time for himself in uh, using that instead of trying to use the rocket fuel and the water reclaimer. How would this have helped? Like, could he have just gone outside and found salt water? Uh, well, what I would suggest is that he probably could have gone outside and perhaps dig down into the subsurface where there's likely ice. Um, and perhaps he could have then taken that out of the ground and purified it in some way. Um, and that would have been a simpler process and uh, less, hazarded to his, um, less hazardous to his life, uh, especially with the, uh, the resulting uh, explosion that happens when he has to try and uh, synthesize water used in the rocket fuel in the story. All right, well, now we are turning into the book. Is it fair to assume that you enjoyed this book? Yes, very Since we're here much. To talk, we're here to talk about it. Well, I, I guess, so you like the book, but I also have a question of like, and it seems like, I guess I, I don't even have to really ask, because it seems like it's also been really uh, strongly embraced by your community of, of Martian scientists and uh, planetary scientists. Is that right? Yes, it really has. We've actually been talking about it a lot um, this week at the uh, European Planetary Science Congress um, because it's a absolutely fantastic book and we're all looking forward to seeing it and we're all talking about when we're going to go to the to the cinema to see that and also uh, you know what we thought of the book itself and how we think the film's going to do in representing this fantastic book. So you have, so what wh- wh- were you at this week? What was the, the EPSL, I think you said? What, what was that? Um, yeah, it's the uh, EPSC, uh, which is the European Planetary Science Congress. So it's basically a big conference uh, where all planetary science, well, as many planetary scientists as can go, really. Uh, we all basically meet up and have a series of talks and discussions and poster sessions and workshops about various topics across planetary science. Um, so there were talks um, from you know the surface of Mars, uh, which I was involved with, uh, ranging to uh, Rosetta, which is uh, to do with the uh, mission to the comets that um, happened, and um, you know things like the latest um, Ceres images and some talks about Pluto. It was a really really good, um, basically a big conference uh, for planetary science. But everyone's actually talking about the Martian. <laughs> a lot of people in the Martian session certainly uh, we were having a uh, we were talking uh, at the poster poster boards and um, talking in the evening at the receptions and things. Uh, I did find that the Martian did come up quite a lot. What does a conference of scientists talk about when they talk about the Martian? Uh, we're talking about um, what we actually thought about it scientifically um, for one side of it and um, just in general things like what was our favourite part of the book and what do we think of Mark Watney and what do we think about the whole premise and you know, especially as well what we think the uh, film's going to do for it and what we think it's going to do for, you know, for Martian research as well and how, how people will, um, if they'll take to Martian research as a result of seeing... Um, the film and reading the book. And I think the book initially catches fire and gets passed around. You start reading it just not because of the science, but because it's a good Cracker Jack story. And The Martian is a fun book to read. Um, but also, and this is what makes the book special and so unique and why I really want to discuss the book is because it's just so full of math and science. And it seems like the scientific community has really embraced that and uh, really likes it and has signed off more or less on generally the scientific accuracy of the book. Is that right? Yeah, we, we really like it, actually. In, in general, I, I particularly find that the book is um, is a really nice representation of what it might actually be like um, to launch a mission to Mars. Um, you know, there's a few obviously little bits which, you know, it's not quite accurate, but, you know, it's all for creative license and the drama of the story. Um, but actually, in general, the science does hold up. They've, you know, they've come up with, for instance, certain uh, technologies that are mentioned that NASA's actually researching, um, which is absolutely incredible. It's fantastic. So from the, a scientist's point, point of view i don't know i mean this is a very basic question what, what was your is there a, a favorite part of the book you had you know is there a part that you found came up the most at the conference um i'm not sure there's a part that came up most at the conference but my particularly favorite part of the book i would say is when he's a uh, his ingenuity in growing crops on the martian surface i found that really interesting okay so this is this was this was really interesting and this is 
Uh, something in the book, I think he says uh, something about how they've been debating if you can grow s- crops in Martian soil for a de- for decades or something like that. Mm. What are the what is what is the prognosis for actually being able to do that? I think you could. I think it'd be possible, um, but you certainly couldn't do it in the Martian environment. It would just be. Um, you know, not very good for life at all due to the high radiation levels that you get on the surface of Mars combined with the extreme temperatures um, and also the lack of um, certain key nutrients such as nitrogen um, within the Martian soil. What you would um, need is you'd need to take the soil and do what Mark Watney did and bring it into some form of a habitat and then add some form of fertilizer and water. But um, aside from that, you have got a lot of nutrients that you would need to grow crops in Martian soil. So I I do think that you could do it. It would be possible. Could we send a robot to try that, maybe? Mm, I'm not sure. I think it'd be quite a challenging challenging thing to try and design a robot uh, to grow crops. I guess that's right. One of my favorite parts uh, of just... I mean, the food is one of the more pressing challenges through the book, right? And I thought one of the more interesting pieces uh, was this idea that he was storing the food by just throwing it outside in the cold Martian environment, which, like, dehi- <laughs> I guess, dehydrated it and f- froze it. Would that work? Um, I think it would, yeah. It's, it's certainly, um, certainly you'd find that in the Martian atmosphere you would get um, the water being lost very quickly and uh, it would dehydrate it. And because of the cold temperatures that you get, you would get um, some form of uh, freezing and preservation in that way. So I do think that would be something you could potentially do on the surface of Mars. Was there uh, a part that you found? I mean, I guess it's like this MacGyver puzzle solving is really like the, the thrust of the book because there's no like – uh, there's no bad guys, you know, like nothing really bad happens to Mark once he lands there. There's like, um, you know, there's the in- the inciting incident where he gets stuck there. But once he's stuck there from the initial dust storm, like nothing. I mean, there's a few other mishaps, but I guess they're all self driven. Like when he shorts out the communication thing, like that's his yeah. fault, you know, like there's no. And I guess he has to deal with a dust storm. But everything else is like pretty much just him doing science. Right. Like there's no. um it's just him moving through it. Is there so? Is there any part of that that like uh, you, you found kept coming up throughout the weekend? Like, is there a part that the scientists kept uh, going back to? I'm not sure. There's a part that we kind of kept going back to because we're having lots of discussions about the book as a whole. Um, I mean, there are certain things that, um, from my end of things, people were talking about what it's actually like. Um, in the area that Mark Watney is meant to be based for the majority of the book um, and where he traverses across down to Schiaparelli uh, Crater. So um, that oh, came up a little bit. Because these are real places to me. Like, I mean, I'm, it's like to me, it's like I'm reading about Middle Earth or something. Like, I'm not really <laughs> like, you know, I see that he's mentioning the geography and that the book actually opens, not unlike a fantasy novel with some maps, you know, before you uh, before you get to the book. I'm assuming those maps are accurate, right? Well, yeah, actually, um, the author requested high-rise images of the site. Um, so they have actually got images of these areas, and you can actually go online and have a look at um, where Mark Watney uh, would have landed and then where he would have traversed to get to the Aries foresight. Um, and it's definitely worth taking a look because you'll actually be able to really see what it's like at the surface of Mars in these areas. Boy, I assume Mars, like, very homogenous. Like, I assume one part of Mars looks like the next part of Mars. Obviously, that's not right. What is unique about the area of Mars that Mark Watney spent his time in? Uh, well, it's a very interesting place. He um, spent most of his time in a place called Acidalia Planitia. Um, and actually, one of the things that um, I personally think is that his journey across down to, uh, to Schiaparelli would have been actually quite challenging because um, although it may look smooth on the large scale, at the small scale, it's not actually that smooth in that area. You get boulder fields that are metres high and um, fissures in the ground. So it would have been a very challenging journey for him. Um, but, you know, you see... Uh, across the surface of Mars, you see very unique features and very interesting features. And it can be very different in different areas of the surface, um, so certainly uh, not quite as homogenous. Um, but in this area, yeah, he would have had a challenging journey through Bastardalia Panicia um, down towards Schiaparelli, and it might actually have got uh, slightly easier, when, slightly smoother, actually, in the areas where he said it was going to be rougher. So... Um, yeah, it's, it's an area that's uh, very interesting to look at, and there's some fantastic high-rise imagery um, that you can take a look at with some descriptions of what it would, what it's actually like in that area. Generally, we're going to give the science a good grade. It sounds like everyone, you know, it's very well considered all ends. But I have to ask, like, are there what of his MacGyver solutions? Was there anything that felt like a stretch to you guys scientifically? 
Um, well, in terms of his actual solutions, um, I personally don't think there was um, anything I could particularly pick up on. There are a lot of his solutions are more engineering based, um, so I can't comment completely on the calculations that he uses. But in general, his solutions tend to be pretty good. Um, the only places where it's, I'd say I I saw slight inaccuracies were more to do with the dramatic stuff that was added to the book, such as the way the dust storm was at the beginning of the book on the surface of Mars, um, and also things such as where he was traversing in Astalia Planitia, because it wouldn't have been a, a smooth place for him to be travelling. Um, and also, when he actually gets to the Ares 4 landing site, there's quite a thick, what might be a thick layer of dust in that area, rather like if you were trying to get through snow. Um, though perhaps it might be a bit cemented, so it might be harder to drive over. But um, so those are the only things that I kind of saw from my end of things that weren't quite accurate. But in terms of his actual MacGyver-like solutions to things, I thought they were really good. And just to be clear, I don't think either of us is saying those small inaccuracies in any way impact um, the value. The, the One, if the book is good or not, and then two, the scientific value of the book. I think like some dramatic license is allowed. Surely that's less than yes. usual, right? Yeah, exactly. I, I really think that um, you know it, it did need these sort of events to happen so it could have a dramatic start to the book, for instance. Because you know, if you had like an actual Martian dust storm happening at the start of the book, it certainly wouldn't be quite as dramatic. So I can understand why uh, you need you need a bit of dramatic license in those sort of things to add the drama to the book, so you can really feel immersed in it and you know really want want things to work out uh, for Mark Watney. One of the things that I thought made the book so special was just the way it combined these calculations that you mentioned uh, with a sort of just a regular good old fashioned like I can't put it down and get cliffhangers where I got to keep reading the next chapter. And, you know, it, the writing is good and it's easy to read, but I've never seen a book with so much math that is so readable. I've never even seen it. I, I don't know anything else like it. Do, do you know any precedent for this? Have you ever read an, another book um, that has this sort of um, combination of like characters and thrillingness, but also uh, deep, rich respect for the science? Um. Hmm, that's quite a difficult question, actually. I'm just trying to think through through all the science fiction that I've read. I mean, there's Star Wars, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> hasn't quite got to, got the science in quite as much. I mean, Star Trek is a great example of where they have actually tried to consider the science a bit. Um, I think personally, there, there's some fantastic. Uh, some fantastic technologies in Star Trek that actually somehow then come into the real world, such as, you know, 3D printers and things like that, and the use of mobile phones. Um, in terms of science fiction books that I really enjoy reading, I really like Ender's Game. Um, and although obviously there is creative license in it, they do take things into consideration, such as um, the way gravity is experienced. Uh, um, and, you know, in this case, a lack of gravity and the fact that no, there is no up, there is no down. And, you know, I thought that was pretty good. Yeah, Ender's Game and the battle games, I guess I forget exactly what those games they play with no gravity are called. Uh, but that I do remember that and reading that. And I only read Ender's Game a few years ago. Uh, but I remember that being something that it really like was one of the first times I really like kind of got what being in zero gravity would be like. Um, and the other thing, the other piece of science that I really think is interesting from that book, and now I guess we're getting into spoiling Ender's Game a little bit too, just to <laughs> cover all our bases. Um, but there, there, there's also just the time it would take, and I thought one of the cool points at the end, one of the cool bits that really stuck with me at the end of the book is there's this pressure uh, to get Ender up to speed by a certain point because the launch fighters are already out there. They're already going because it's going to take so long to reach there, and they just have um, that magic communication. They can communicate with them quicker, and they just talk about like the relative speeds of things. So like, I don't know, you know, I, I, Ender's game is, is isn't the Mar isn't quite up to the Martian, but it's certainly above that Star Wars level of science, you know? Yeah, I think it is really good. And actually, um, thinking about those sort of things, it does bring into reality certain missions that have actually been launched. Um, the fact that by the time the um, the object, you know, the the actual device will arrive um, at what it's meant to study, um, the technology that it's actually using is very old. Um, and it's taken so long to get there. Right. That, so that's actually something that interests in the Ender's Game in some ways kind of makes you think about is the fact that actually with a lot of missions that we've launched, um, the technology is old by the time that it gets there. And, you know, it's, that's certainly something interesting to think about. Have you read any of the 9 million uh, Ender's Game sequels? There's a chart on, <laughs> on Wikipedia of, like, 
how the Ender's Game sequels go, because it branches off into, like, two paths, and then they eventually connect. It's very complicated. Have you ever read any of them? No, I haven't, actually. I've, I really like Ender's Game, and I was a bit concerned. I didn't know what the sequels would be like. Yeah, so. the sequels are not... Well, the, there's two. So there's the Bean... There's sequels that follow Bean, who is his friend he makes, and those are, like, more Earthbound and... Um, pretty good and that also follows Ender's siblings but then the ones that follow Ender get like really abstract and start talking about um, Speaker of the Dead is the second one yeah. and they, get, they become very um, metaphysical almost so and I don't know they, none of them are quite as good as Ender's Game so yeah. w- w- what else I mean I feel like The Martian this book is like immediately in the canon of sci-fi for scientists along with 2001 I feel like 2001 gets a lot of love for scientific accuracy is that right? Yeah, it does get quite a lot of love. It gets mentioned quite a lot as a, a hot read for scientists. Right. Um, but I certainly do feel that The Martian is kind of now one of these books that you know every scientist will want to read because it's something that does appeal on all sorts of different levels, especially because Mark Watney, you know, he's an engineer as well, which is fantastic. So that kind of gets brought into it a lot with the calculation side of things and the way he approaches everything. It's all from this engineering perspective of, right, I've got a problem, I need to solve it. Um, right. and it's it's really good. So let's you mentioned earlier when you talk about the book with the other scientists, you talk about like Mark Watney and that character. So let's talk about that because I did I like Mark Watney, but he is you don't know anything about his life back home. He has like no family, is like no um, love interests <laughs> anywhere else in the book, right? Like his character, like he's funny. He makes jokes to like kind of I think maybe help survive his situation and to you know and make the book fun too. Uh, but there's. He is his whole character. Is he basically? He's a problem solver. Like his character is. Um, he's almost like uh, I'm trying to think of. Uh, he's a, he's like Professor Layton. He's just moving from puzzle to puzzle. What what do you guys talk about when you talk about Mark Watney? How does the scientific community respond to that character? I think he's really, he's got a lot of ingenuity. He's, he's very kind of very intelligent and his level of positivity is fantastic. He's, he's just this kind of go-getter engineer who is constantly faced with these things that happen to him and yet he keeps kind of this sunny attitude throughout it and just works through the problem and comes up with solutions, very interesting solutions as well, thinking outside the box all the time. And that's really what you would need if you were going to send someone to Mars. You would need someone who, you know, if something did go slightly wrong, they would be able to come up with a solution and think on their feet. Although they would obviously have the support of the large community of scientists um, in the background working um, to support such a mission. Yeah, I think Mark, uh, you know, his mental health, of all the things that are problems, food, air, not exploding, his mental health is never really thrown into question in the book. You know, he's never yeah. going crazy. He's never, you know, I mean, he mentions missing other people, but it's not really like a threat to his survival, like the way it very probably could be, I suppose, if you were stranded on Mars, right? Yeah, I think it would be an incredibly difficult situation. I, I honestly don't know how someone would cope with that sort of scenario. I mean, they actually have to do a lot of um, sort of um, experiments in a way as to try and work out the way in which humans would react to um, being on the surface of Mars. Um, and in these simulations, it's, it's groups of people that um, they're talking about rather than just a single person on their own on this essentially desolate, desert planet. So... You know, it would be very challenging and the thought of are oh, you going to make it back and there's no human contact for a large part of the story at the beginning um, so you know the fact that he manages to get through it and still be positive it really says something about the, the character that has been created here um, but you would you would certainly need that though he does get a bit annoyed by disco music quite a lot right 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 <laughs> well at least he has those the USB sticks full of like uh, <laughs> material I guess you know I guess the po- I like the format of the book and how most of the book is sort of like primary documents like most of the book is reading um, his logs which um, you know and so which is a format I like for a book like I like um, World War Z is a great book I really enjoyed and the um that's that also has this sense of like primary documents where the book is actually audio logs left behind by people who survived this war or whatever. Um, but, you know, World War Z actually has a lot of problem solving in it, too, now that I'm thinking about it. 
Yeah, it does. But but <laughs> um, I think it's implied though in the book that like the audio logs are part of like that's who he's talking to. Like he's talking to us, the reader, and like that's part of what's keeping him sane. He's like, and I guess he's also talking to like the Martian, the NASA scientists who may find his records in years. Yeah. Um, but you know, I I think it's the 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 logs that he writes are sort of what um I imagine I guess what keeps him sane, right? Yeah, I think they are, and they're very interesting to read, and the way that they develop is interesting, because, you know, he kind of starts off at the beginning talking about, you know, if he's going to starve, he'd rather kill himself before he starves, and obviously that's quite dark, but um, he gets even more upbeat later on when he suddenly thinks, oh, I'm definitely going to survive, and people are going to read this, so I need to be careful what I'm putting. Right. Um, And that was certainly very interesting to read, but I do think they keep him sane, because it's almost like he's using them as a person to talk to um someone that he can kind of interact with in a certain way and it's that and it's the kind of um visual and audio stimulus of all these things that he has on the memory sticks that keep him going it's trying to give him something to keep him occupied rather than just this kind of quiet you know landscape around him because i don't think i think if he didn't have that he he would have probably gone insane because i don't know how anyone could possibly cope in that sort of situation the book talks a a little bit about the background of these scientists and how mark is um you know they want to be very efficient and like you know they they can only send so many people (laughs) to mars so that mark is an engineer i believe as well as a botanist which is pretty convenient for the plot but let's roll with it for a second um but you know they talk about how everyone on the ship has sort of a dual discipline and um is first of all is that right like is that how going to space works you got to be good at two things as well as have the metal to go to space well, I certainly think if you're going to be an astronaut, you do need to be skilled in a number of areas to be able to cope with it um, because you've got to go through actually getting to wherever you're going to go and then actually performing scientific tasks. Um, and I do think that they are very careful to make sure that the people they select are going to be able to cope well in their teams and in their groups and that they're going to be able to perform the tasks that are needed to they, they need to perform when they're actually up there. Um, and they do make sure that um, each of the crew members in in the plot of the Martian um, does have dual skills and you know is is basically intensely trained to be able to deal with the situations because they do talk briefly about the sort of training that um, they've gone through and I do think um, though I'm not sure entirely that this does seem pretty accurate as the sort of training that astronauts do have to go through before they can be sent up into space. They also talk about a lot about how the as some of the astronauts, um, the Commander Lewis in particular, has a military background. So is that do we send military people into space? How does that work, and why? Well, one of the big reasons why you consider send, sending someone from the military to space, and at least in my thinking, is the fact that um, they've had to be trained to deal with very high tense, you know, high pressure situations um, in which they have to react very, very quickly um, in extreme scenarios, and that would be really useful for an astronaut because you know if something did go wrong, you would need to be able to think very quickly in a very stressful situation um, and actually the military they, they do provide very good training in these areas and also it's in the aspects of you know we've got fantastic pilots in, in our air forces across the across the world um, and you do need very good pilots to pilot our spacecraft aren't they doing a thing right now where is there some test somewhere where they lock some people in a room to see how they would <laughs> survive how it might be to be on Mars by yourself for some time Yes, they've, um, there's actually one going on at the moment. You can follow them on Twitter and they're actually blogging from inside. Um, it's something called High Seas. Um, it's in Hawaii and this is a, um, a NASA operation where I believe they're being locked in there for a year. Um, it's a group of people that have been specially selected and they're simulating what it would be like to be on the Martian surface. So they have a 20 minute delay in communications and where every time they go outside they have to perform tasks such as collecting samples and they have to be wearing a spacesuit while they're doing it and they're actually based at um, somewhere we use as a Martian analog site so this is a site that's similar to Mars um, as similar to Mars as you can get on the Earth's surface um, and we're actually doing this to try and work out you know what it's actually like and how people cope uh, with this sort of a mission and um, being in this sort of situation for long periods of time but um, I'd certainly certainly go and have a look at their blogs because it's it's interesting to read especially with uh, obviously having read The Martian and you're reading logs of um, a theoretical person on the surface of Mars you can actually read 
what it's like for these people simulating um, a Martian mission. Quick check-in. How are we doing as humanity on getting people to Mars? Well, NASA has announced a journey to Mars, which um, is a really big thing. So they say they want to get people to Mars in 2030s, I believe. Um, now, to actually get to that point, there's a lot of research that needs to develop um, quite rapidly, really, to ensure that someone could get to Mars and get back safely, uh, because that's the key thing here. It's making sure that if we're going to send people to Mars, they can come back and that whilst they're there, um, they're, they're kept safe and um, that they can actually survive on the surface of Mars. And a number of things do need to develop in this area because we need to understand more about what it's actually like on the surface of Mars. So people like myself need to research potential an- landing sites, for instance, on the surface. Um, combined with actually considering how someone could survive on the surface, so things such as food, water, um, oxygen, and you know what they're actually going to stay in whilst they're on the surface of Mars. Because one of the big things is that there's a lot of radiation um, on the surface of Mars. And actually, I think this gets mentioned briefly in The Martian, where Mark Watney says something such as, "I would get cancer on my cancer," um, because unfortunately, yeah, it's very. There's a lot of radiation. So Just because there's no the atmosphere, surface. right? Because I think that's mentioned too. Yeah, there's nothing to shield you. We are, we're very lucky on the Earth in that we have a wonderful atmosphere to shield and to uh, get rid of a lot of this radiation before it gets to us, whereas on Mars, you just don't have this. Why would just... I'm playing devil. I think Mars is cool. I just read the book, so I actually... You know, before, if you asked me, I would have said, yeah, we should go to Mars. But I got to say, the book really did energize me. But let's pretend for a second that I don't think we should go to Mars. I'm one of these people. And there was this was actually happened on um, the Nightly Show, on Larry Wilmore Show this week. They had two people arguing with Bill Nye. And it was sort of a comedic bit. But they were arguing, like, we don't care about going to Mars. We got problems here. And, like, they, they were sort of, it was sort of tongue-in-cheek. And the people, I think, were being funny. But those people are out there. And going to Mars is expensive. It is dangerous. And it's actually... Um, very briefly, I think just for one or two sentences in the book, um, it's sort of acknowledged by um, the NASA director back home that like people are starting to not feel great about the cost of saving this one guy. So just yeah. you know, putting all of that in sight, like why should we go to Mars? Well, I think that going to Mars is something that's really important for humanity as a whole. One, it's a fantastic mission that would bring together a lot of different nations um, in a very interesting way so that we would all work together to get people to the surface of Mars. So on an international collaboration side of things, it's really important. Um, But also because, you know, we do have to consider things such as the fact that, you know, this planet might not be here forever. So we do need to consider what it would be like to set up on a different planet so we do need to do things such as send people to other worlds and Mars is a fantastic place to do this because it's a neighboring planet that we are researching quite heavily so we, we're finding out more and more about this uh, this planet and also because it could answer some really big questions for us about things such as you know, where has life on Earth come from because for instance if you did find evidence for life on Mars Um, which may be something that happens in the future, that brings up huge questions as to did life actually start on Mars and then come to Earth? Uh, So there's many different reasons, I think, both scientifically and on the side of, you know, human collaboration and human exploration that we should send people to Mars. Is there any... Uh, anything in the scientific community today that suggests that that happened, that, like, life originated as assuming bacteria or something on Mars... Well, some people do consider this. Um, it's certainly some, something that some people do research within the community. Um, and it would be one of the big things that would be thrown up, really, if we did find bacteria on the surface of Mars or most likely in the subsurface of Mars. Um, it would make you start to question um, the origins of life. You know, did you get similar, you know, for instance, if we did find bacteria that was kind of almost Earth like, so carbon based. Uh, would that mean that you've got life evolving on two planets at the same time? So does that mean life is actually more prevalent than we realise? Or does that mean that life started on Mars and then came to Earth maybe on a meteorite? Who knows? It's interesting talking about, um, you know, maybe we need another planet to move to at some point. Because this book, which is like, you know, science fiction and takes place sort of in an unspecified point in the future. This book's like, we could barely, you know, make do up there and, like, Mm -hmm. grow potatoes. So to think of the idea about, you know, moving some people up there permanently is crazy, but at the same time, it's like, we got if it's ever going to happen, it seems like over a long enough timeline, I guess it's going to become necessary, um, we got to start taking steps, right? Like, it's like these are the first steps you got to take in order to get people up there, right? 
But exactly, I do think there needs to be these sorts of things done. We need to find out, can we cope on the surface of other worlds? So in particular, though, I think one of the first steps would be perhaps to consider something such as um, a base on the moon, because it's closer to us. So if there were any issues, you could get someone there very quickly um, to try and help. Um, so I do think that we do need to be taking certain steps and considering this because this is essentially the future of humanity that we're considering here. Um, we do need to do a lot of research and past that research needs to be things such as sending people to these places. Can we grow crops on the surface of Mars? And, you know, how do we cope with, um, you know, with a mission to Mars as, as a world? It didn't even occur to me, and I guess this is to the book's credit, it didn't even occur to me until I sat down and prepare for this, um, that the book doesn't even specify what year it takes place in. Like, mm. it feels like the present, my ignorant self, who has no idea what we actually have in terms of space travel. But I guess certainly, you know, um, it mentions there's been a few there's been a few trips to Mars, I think, at this point in the book. Like, there may be the third or fourth people to be on Mars. You know, he's the first person to get stuck there. Um, but it's sort of at an unspecified place in the future. If you had to, like, peg it at a year, do you have any sense of when the events of this book could even be on the table to transpire? Well, I'm not sure when they could potentially be on the table, mainly because of things such as the massive spacecraft that they use to get to Mars. That would certainly take a long time, I think, anyway, to, to build... Um, and to actually be able to fund, because that would be a very expensive spacecraft. Um, but I have um, I have seen certain people debating about this, and some people think that um, they've tried to match it to the Journey to Mars timeline, in which case this could be something happening in the, the 2040s, 2030s sort of bracket, which is actually quite soon, really, when you think about it. Totally. Um, I'm relieved to hear it's <laughs> happening in my lifetime, you know? Like, I want to see this stuff go down. Yeah, so do I. I'm, I'm just hoping that um, this timeline does stay the way this is. But um, I would say, though, that there is a lot that needs to be done. So uh, I'd say the 2030s is perhaps um, a little bit too soon for us to be ready to send people to Mars. Um, but we are certainly invested in um, in trying to get people there. And numerous space agencies have now turned themselves onto this sort of a sort of a topic. So. Hopefully, this means that the research is going to progress very quickly, and we should hopefully be starting to develop the technology and um, develop the knowledge that we need to get people to Mars, hopefully within our lifetime. So that would be very exciting. Do you think that pop culture has a legitimate role in science and uh, like movies like this are actually uh, – I'm sorry, God – and books like this – jeez uh, – but, you know – Books and movies, I should say, because even though this started as a book and we're talking about the book, presumably the movie will bring it an even larger audience. And it seems like that's like an important thing that's like actually um, a good for humanity that pop culture is doing. Is this just like a one time phenomenon or does pop culture actually have like a role in science? Well, I think anyway, I feel that pop culture does have a role within science because it captures the public imagination. And I think you see this with with science fiction in general, such as things like like Star Trek, um, for instance. And I know this is a, a TV series, but there are some books and movies. Um, these sorts of things, they do capture people's imagination. And they start to think about the ideas of expanding into the universe and studying, you know, what's around us and what's out there. And I think that's what's really important about pop culture, because you really do need public support for these sorts of things. You need people to be behind this 100 um, percent because you do need that true unity to be able to achieve something such as getting someone to Mars. So I think that pop culture is really important for science. I think it's it's very important to get people interested and also to inspire the future generations of scientists because a lot of people, you, you know, I started to be science fiction, for instance, from a very young age. I was introduced it for you know by my dad because you know he's a big Star Trek fan, for instance, which is why I talk about it quite a lot. And it's one of the things that inspired me to become a scientist was to see these things and think, wow, that's amazing. You know, let's actually see what what it's like within science and see what we can do. So, so I think pop culture is very important. Star Trek is an interesting example because more than the specific science and like the the hows, which are, you know, a little magical sometimes, there's a lot of like philosophical questions that Star mm. Trek raises, right? And I don't know that I guess that's in the Martian too, but I feel like that's that's more that Star Trek's all about it. It's at its very core, right? Yeah, I do think there are a lot of philosophical questions. And actually, Ender's Game brings us in slightly um, as well in, in a different way. Um, but there's all these kind of questions about what it would be like if uh, you did discover 
essentially life out there and in, in the case of Star Trek and then this game intelligent life um, and what that would actually mean and how would we cope and how would we all interact and would we be able to understand one another and would there then be this struggle for dominance and you know how would it affect society you know how would that how would that come about would it bring peace to society would it link us all together as um, as nations which you know is that that's what i hope for i think you know missions to mars for instance would bring about international collaboration and great discussion um on both the scientific side but on the political side as well and i think it you know that's a that's a fantastic thing well that's an interesting point because that comes up in the book right and they need to go to china to um, use one of their shuttles. But there's an interesting point of diplomacy in the book where the Chinese scientists actually say, you know, let's not get the government involved. Let's keep this between mm-hmm. scientists. And it seemed, you know, it's, it's only a line or two, and these are not major characters in the book, but it still seemed like a very deliberate thing. Um, and I, it sort of felt, to me at least, like sort of a poke on uh, politics and saying that, like, you know, just get out of the way and let these scientists do their thing. That's how I read that part anyway. Yeah, I think it is kind of a, a brief comment on the fact that, one, you need international collaboration, and this should be between all nations, even nations that in some ways historically have struggled to communicate in the past. Um, mm-hmm. But it's also a comment on the fact that um, sometimes scientists perhaps need to be more involved in the discussions that go on within politics, um, and that this this kind of communication needs to be allowed, that you know, you do need to kind of listen to scientists as to what what's going on and what needs to be done to achieve certain things. And it's a re- it's a really nice moment in the book too, actually, because they even acknowledge the Chinese that they could not help the Americans and not help Mark Watney, and no one would even know no one would even know the difference. You know, like it's just uh, they could get away with it, and uh, no one would even know they decided not to help. Yet, but they still decide to help. So I think that's a nice moment. And the other thing the book does is it, I think it makes it very clear that. Um, it's not, it's, this is like Mark Watney is not a superhero and, you know, he's the protagonist and he does most of the, the MacGyvering, most of the puzzle solving, mm. but there's thousands of people on Earth who are helping him. Some who don't, you know, some who have names, but some who don't. There's just like hundreds of anonymous people who work overtime to build shuttles and half the time they should take to be built. Or um, there's the character who comes up with the plan to get the, um, the, Ares 4, I think, that he was on back, you know, basically to get his friends back to rescue him. Like, this is a character who just, like, a previously unknown character who just sort of comes up with a solution. He's just, like, one person who's working at NASA. And it seems to me, like, what I get out of that is the idea that um, it, that it's a, it's not just uh, got to be a few people. This has to be all of humanity working on these problems. Yes, I certainly feel that way. I think, you know, the more people you have working on it, the better. And, you know, there are these huge teams, you know, massive groups of people working together for each mission that's launched. And, you know, they will work overtime. They will work incredibly hard to make sure that these missions are successful. And I think that was what was nice in the book is that they, they, they were mentioned, basically, that that these kind of unsung heroes who, who often do go kind of slightly unnoticed, that they were mentioned in this way, you know, because these things do happen. You do have these these massive teams of scientists and the general public who, who get involved um, and try to support and keep these missions going. Um, I mean, a great example, for instance, is um, what happened with Apollo 13 and the way the scientists, uh, you know, back home had to work to try and come up with a solution in a very, very difficult situation. This book really made me think about Apollo 13, which I hadn't in a while, because that movie uh, is so iconic that, you know, with the Houston, we have problems, that I hadn't actually remembered that there was a real incident at the core of that story in a long time. What exactly happened there? Remind me. Um, well, basically, there was a, a massive issue happens. They were having issues with, like, um, I... I haven't looked at it for quite a while, but I believe it was uh, CO2. They had some problems with trying to um, stop that from building up to high levels. So they had some issues with CO2, with the CO2 filters, I think. Um, I could actually check that because I haven't looked at it for quite a while. But what I kind of take away from it is that the Martian, I think, does largely kind of have a lot of basis in what happened with Apollo 13, which was the fact that they came up very quickly with solutions to this problem. And it was using just random things that they had available to them um, and, you know, putting together this kind of very, very interesting solution 
to the problem in a very short period of time to, to save the lives of these astronauts. And um, I do think that when I read The Martian, I, I can't help but think that the author um, was thinking about Apollo 13 a lot when, when he wrote um, the character of Mark Watney. Right. That is, I think... You know, there's a great comic um, online, XKCD, and they did uh, a great, I'm sure people know it, and they did a comic that, again, I'm sure people have seen where they talk, they basically said that the Martian is that one scene in Apollo 13 where they work out how they can power the ship blown up uh, to be an entire movie. Or to, in the comic, they say to be an entire book, and then someone says, how are they going to make that a Matt Damon movie? And he's like, I don't know, but I got to see it. Do you have a similar attitude? Do you, are, this movie, how are you feeling about it? It's out. Um, probably a lot of people. Well, it's people seem to like it. The reviews are very strong. Um, but you know, book to movie always iffy. You're, you're going to see it. I imagine you already said that. I think. What, what do you What do you think about it? Well, I'm looking forward to seeing it tentatively. Um, I'm hoping that it will be a really good representation of the book and that it will inspire people to want to look into Martian research a bit more. Um, I mean. There are some concerns as to how they're actually going to represent certain things. Like I, I wasn't entirely sure at the beginning how they were going to represent the way in which the story has been told, which is mainly through these logs. Um, so I was a bit concerned as to how entirely that would work and how accurately they might represent the Martian surface as well. Um, but at the same time, I'm excited about it because I think that we've got the technology, we've got the capability now to do this really successfully. Um, especially with the fantastic images that we have from Mars. They can make some great landscapes. Um, so um, I'm looking forward to seeing the film uh, very tentatively because I, I really am interested in how they're going to translate this book into the film and how they're going to represent the science side of it and also how they're going to represent things such as uh, Mark Watney's character and the images of the, uh, the Martian landscape. Um, I do think that we've got um, the technology and capability now of representing this in a really good way. So I'm very interested to see how this is going to be done. And I'm also kind of interested to see the reaction of everyone in the cinema as well and how they find it. And, um, you know, do they react well to it? Though I'm not sure if I'd be able to tell that or not. Um, but I'm just hoping, really, that they're going to represent this fantastic book in a really good way in the, the cinema. And I know there's going to be some creative license to it, but, you know, there kind of needs to be. Um, but I'm hoping that it kind of stays true to the values of the book. It's interesting because I think it'll be a good lesson in what movies and books can do differently. Because the book, there's a lot of math in this book. I keep mentioning that and because I, <laughs> uh, I, I just think it's like one of the most interesting things about it is the way it combines math and story and character to create something really interesting and really exciting. Um, and like, obviously, there can't there can't possibly be as much math in the movie. But what the movie can do uh, is some things the book can't do, which is like, you know. Um, generate these incredible vistas of Mars and, like, uh, give you an idea of what it looks like, which is, like, you know, um, uh, different but also illuminating and also potentially educational and um, potential, has the potential, I think, to get people excited about Mars. So it'll be interesting to see how the re what the reaction of that is and uh, how people feel about it. It seems like it's been completely – it seems like scientists and NASA – I mean, I think NASA knows, like, what a great PR tool this is. They seem to, like, really be embracing it. I see them tweeting about it and stuff like that a lot. So it seems to have been well-received. Yes, and they've been uh – from what I've seen, anyway, they've been involved in the actual uh, making of right, this film. Right, 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 right. Uh, which is really good to hear. <laughs> yeah, I think they did something similar. I feel like when uh, Interstellar came out, there was a similar, like, don't worry, guys, this one has actual science in it vibe to it. <laughs> um, and I, I did like that movie, and it did make me think about uh, time dilation. How does that one hold up scientifically? Um, well, I'm not actually sure. This is, this is really terrible, but I haven't actually seen Interstellar. It's not That's a lot. I don't care. It's not terrible. <laughs> it's, it's like a total... Yeah, I feel like it's terrible because I really wanted to see it, but uh, I never got the chance to in the end. So it's still one that's on my list of things that I really want to see. But from what I've heard from other people who've seen it, they do say that it is, um, it's, it's a very good film. So, you know, and that's, that's from um, other scientists. So right. they seem to like it, yeah. I do like it as a movie. There's definitely some actual science in there, but there's also a little potentially magic, let's say. Whereas, <laughs> like, the, si the Martian is, like, straight up, like, engineering solutions and calculations and hard numbers and math. Um, and I really enjoyed that for it. Uh, what, uh, well, you know, before we finish here, 
Uh, what's like a good follow up? Like, I really enjoyed this book. What 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 could I read next? What's like another piece of like sciencey science fiction that you would recommend? We talked about Ender's Game, and I got to ask you. Maybe you can answer this one first. What's your favorite episode of Star Trek? Ooh, now that is something I can't say. There's too many good episodes. Well, like, first of all, what are we talking? Original series, Next Gen, <laughs> Deep Space Nine. What's your well, What's your particular flavor? I actually quite like Deep Space Nine. I think it's really interesting. I think that it's quite a slow building one. I think the first series, um, you know, often people say, oh, I can't get past the first series. But actually, it really builds up and you've got these interesting developments and there's interesting kind of character development, I think, within that. I really, really enjoyed Deep Space Nine. So I would recommend that. I think so. I think um, if you haven't managed to uh, watch it all the way through, I would highly recommend actually sitting down and, and watching Deep Space Nine. Nine, all the way through. I gotta admit, I've never seen all of Deep Space Nine. I've seen like a handful of them, but Deep Space Nine <laughs> is, I think, a, a little ahead of its time in that it had like this overarching plot and like that you had to like follow it week to week and like there, which is, mm. you know, I think how most TV shows, especially in the wake of like Breaking Bad and The Sopranos work. Um, but at the time, I think that was really novel. And I think, you know, like that's not how Next Gen works. That's not how the original series works. Um, mm. So that, that was pretty interesting. Is there like a favorite. Is there a moment in, in Star Trek you can think of that, like, uh, you know, really illuminates a particular piece of science or scientific thinking for you? Hmm. So a lot of Star Trek, I think it's more the kind of relationships between the different species that I find interesting. And the way they bring in these ideas of them having different cultures and... Um, the way in which they kind of interact and have to be kind of aware of these cultural differences. Um, and that, for me, is what I find really interesting. In terms of science, they do have some very interesting ideas, um, and I find things like the ideas of the replicators very interesting, which is something which people do work towards, and there will be generators, and the fact that you can kind of heal these wounds um, very quickly and again that's a technology that's been developed um by science so i I find that in general the the actual technology that comes about in it i just find it interesting how then not that long after sometimes you actually see it coming about in reality um but for me in in star trek it's it's more i i I really enjoy seeing the way these different alien cultures are represented and and in deep space nine they have some very interesting episodes to do with um like truly alien aliens as in they just don't seem to understand humanity um and yeah i won't spoil it but i find that very interesting let's bring it back to books for a second any any other science fiction books you would recommend people who uh, enjoyed The Martian? What things they could read next that might scratch the same itch? We already talked about Ender's Game. Yes, yes, we have talked about Ender's Game. We um, spoiled it, so hopefully, hopefully that's <laughs> not the one you were going to follow this up with. We sort of spoiled it, but yeah, just only slightly. I actually um, think you could still read and enjoy Ender's Game based on the conversation we had here. I think I think so as well. And you definitely should if you have it. I only read it. I was like 20 years late to the game here. I only read it a few years ago, but it's like extremely readable and great. And it's um, very it's you should definitely read Ender's Game if you haven't. Oh, certainly. And, there's this, and don't there's watch the movie. I got a feeling the Mar- <laughs> I think the Martian movie can will almost certainly do a better job, uh, do more justice for the Martian than Ender's Game did for Ender's Game. Oh, I really hope so. I was so disappointed by the Ender's yeah, Game. Yeah, that movie was not very good. So, okay, uh, so we got Ender's Game. What else can we read? Um, well, I quite like um, a lot of classic sci-fi. There's a fantastic series that you can you can get of books, which is the, the Sci-Fi Masterworks, and it has some amazing titles in there, such as uh, Do Android's Dream of Electric Sheep, and that would be one I'd recommend, actually. I find that a very yeah, interesting. Yeah, that's the book that Blade Runner, the movie Blade Runner, was based on, not to always yes. bring up movies when we're talking about this. Um, but it's Philip K. Dick, and I have to admit, I've never read any Philip K. Dick. Maybe that will be the next Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin Show book club. Yeah, I, I would recommend it. It's a, it's a yeah, I should do that. Piece. And it's a nice, yeah. it's a nice size as well. You could read it, and then you could uh, watch the, yeah, listen to the next book club and uh, talk about it. Well, Laura, let me ask you. You know, we were talking about how all the scientists in The Martian were working on, you know, saving Mark Watney. If this happens in the present, if we're launching to Mars, you know, what what would you like your role in this to be? Would you would you be an astronaut? Do you think you could imagine going to Mars? <laughs> well, I don't think um, I myself could be an astronaut, but I would, um, it'd be nice to be involved. I certainly think it'd be an incredibly exciting thing to be involved in. And What, I think what would be like pers- your ideal role in, in, the, in going to Mars? 
Well, I think my personal role would probably be um, something such as helping choose the landing sites for the mission, um, because that's a sort of thing that uh, I can see myself doing, because I work with um, satellite imagery at the moment. So choosing somewhere that would be safe for them to go to, where they're going to get some form of shelter, and where they could have access uh, to water and to the things that they're going to be necessary for them to survive on the surface of Mars and then launch from the surface of Mars later. So, yeah, I think I'd be a landing site selection sort person super cool i mean that's very exciting i hope you get the chance i hope we get the chance to do that as humanity i hope you're the person behind the computer that gets us there um is it how can people follow your work is there anything people can do online to keep up with what you're studying um, yeah yeah they can always uh, follow me on twitter i'm at laura m brooker uh, so I'll tweet about my work every now and then. I also just tweet general space things, so they can always follow me on there. Um, and I will be at conferences as well, so I will be uh, talking about work in those sorts of situations. And um, hopefully, I'll be uh, publishing some of my work during the year so in scientific journals. Well, I've been following you all this week as you are at um, God. I hope I get the letters right. ESPC, I want to say, <laughs> yeah, and yes, uh, yeah. EPSE, very close, closer than I think last earlier in the podcast. Uh, I think I have the letters right this time. But anyway, it was really like, that's not something I was aware existed. I'm probably never going to go, honestly. Um, but so, so to read like your dispatches from the panels you were attending, I, I very much enjoyed. So go follow Laura on Twitter. And Laura, thank you so much for uh, talking about The Martian today. It's no problem. Thanks for having me. All right, first order of business, I got to let you know, Laura got in touch as soon as the episode ended to let me know that she had misspoke and that it was actually an oxygen tank that had exploded on Apollo 13. Uh, we regret the error. To learn more about the Apollo 13 mission, uh, visit Wikipedia. Visit your local Wikipedia. Uh, thank you, uh, not only to Laura, but also to everyone who participated in this, our first Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin Show book club. I got a lot of tweets over the past few weeks. Um, the people reading the book uh, in anticipation of this episode and enjoying it, and it made reading the book more fun for me, and I hope this made reading the book more fun for you, and uh, I thought it was great, so we're definitely going to do this again, and so thank you, uh, everyone who read the book. But we will not be doing a book club again next week, because next week on the show, and I mean it when I say next week, this episode is going to come out next week. Uh, that's right, I have an erratic release schedule, deal with it. Uh, next week on the show, we're going to be talking to Tan Strauss Schultz. Olsen, uh, who directed the upcoming film The Final Girls, as well as Harold and Kumar 3, and some cool web shorts, and some college humor stuff, which is how I know him in the first place. And Todd, in addition to being a great director, uh, has this insane, uh, very deep, very true passion for movies, uh, and cinema, and just movies. Uh, so next week on this podcast, Todd's going to stop by, and we are going to talk about our favorite movie moments. going to get real granular and get down to uh, our favorite moments that make our favorite movies. Movies so great and kind of dissect how those work and that will be on the Jeff Rubin Jeff Rubin show next week and uh, you will be the first to hear about it if you follow me on Twitter where I'm at Jeff Rubin show uh, on Tumblr on Facebook you can go to Jeff Rubin Jeff Rubin.com for all of these links uh, as well as uh, every episode of this show uh, you can get my email address let me know who you'd like to hear on the show in the future and um, it'll be fun it'll be fun yeah it will be fun all right no big deal uh, we will see you in a week bye for now